introduce. The, for all the people who are coming after us for being negative, just give us something good. Yeah. Stop it. Like it's, it's not like on any of us are we're hoping this stuff to be bad. I actually really hoped She Hulk would be good. Yeah. Yeah. Seriously. Likewise. <laughs> yeah, me too. I was public about it. Yep. Yeah. yeah. I've been on streams where I said I think because again, I, I know of Jessica Gow's work. I thought she was would be good for this. Um, but no. Turns out the she didn't have the system in place to uh to to d deliver something that would have been worthy of the of the responsibility she had. And I thought this would have been, you know, sort of maybe more of a breakout role for Ms. Lani, um, who has a very successful career in Orphan Black, but this would have propelled her into superstardom, I think, if it had been successful, yeah. um, having a character so unusual, unlike any other character out there, as She-Hulk could have been something that really defined her. She would have become iconic with this. <laughs> I think I she was part of the conspiracy, though, um the the female conspiracy i mean i i love her i think she's the was the only reason to uh actually tune into the show uh but the last episode especially where she was if you can act sarcastically when she was acting like the bill bixby version of the she hulk show where she was be, being the female bill bixby and pretending to be on a computer typing and stuff like that and i thought that's sarcastic acting this 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 is the all the ladies getting together and telling everyone the f you. Uh, it was a very extraordinary uh, episode, especially the way they started it with the, uh, you know, with the original Hulk parody. That that was just like a giant finger to everyone who yes. one loved that show. <laughs> and number two, awful. anticipating you know the man babies who were not going to love this art that the ladies had already put together for the first date. And we're just going to stick it up your ass with this, you know, little bit of parody stuff. And, and, and it really annoyed me that maybe I'm I was also thinking no, is that the target audience, the target audience of this series, which has to be uh, coastal millennial women who are extremely dissatisfied with their dating life and who hate men, because seriously, that is who Jen addresses whenever she breaks the fourth wall. None of those target audiences have even seen that series. They're not going to get the references. It's yeah, like that... pointless to have them there in the first place. I'm so sick of the misandry in this series. Um, Honestly, the men who have been in the show, especially the superheroes, well, maybe not the, the really bad superhero, but the majority of them are really nice men. This is so ridiculous, um, you know, to paint a show in this manner. And I think we all know what this show really is about because because they showed what the show was about in the last episode when we entered in that writer's room. That's what the show is about. It was never about any other characters other than what was it, six people who were sitting at that table um, and maybe advertising this for, you know, a particular company. But they wanted their 15 minutes or five minutes or one second in the spotlight and they got it. And honestly, I had to turn it off after that moment. Wow. And, and I, I put it to the panel who saw the show. I thought it was really unusual that with an, a show that was uh, promoted as women driven, that they had a guy doing most of the talking in the panel in that sea of women at that table. There's a term for men like that. No, well, scapegoat. They needed a scapegoat. Yeah. To place dead, because I noticed this. Here is this one guy in the dead center of the camera. In the, so he's the one that's basically being scapegoated. And also, it's important that he be there so that the women can uphold their victim narrative. Like, see, we can't even have an all-female writer's room. Look at that okay. guy sitting so in I'm the not center. Crazy. And I, I, I bet got. you that he's not an actual part of the writer's room. No. He was no. an actor that was brought in there. The rest of the women there, oh, they're definitely part of it. You had like, that stupid gal chick who was there getting uh, another moment in the sun because... Uh, yeah, I wasn't talking. To... No, she wasn't talking, but her surrogate no. was. on her the surrogate, surrogate was, yes. was, so yeah. was the actual was writers? No, no. Um, Gao is the only actual writer. The rest are actually actors, just playing the writers. Okay. Uh, the, uh, Gao was to the right of the surrogate male <laughs> punching bag. Yeah. On the left so, part of the front. Yeah, so I just thought it was unusual that 
the, you know, the, the women in that room or the person pl playing Gao uh, did not stand up to take credit and, and talk to uh, She Hulk about this situation. It was a guy. Now, there, there are several episodes that were written by men. But on, on the other hand, we all, we all, script doctor will, can talk to it just because it says written by an individual. Uh, the, the, the showrunner can completely rewrite the episode oh, any yeah. way that they want. Yeah, you so just you you get the credit, but necessarily doesn't mean you did the the actual work that showed up on screen. Right, right. Maybe so, you started it, but and it was assigned to you, but the show writer fixed it or something. Yeah, so that was a really weird moment that a show that was advertised as being driven by women and proudly so, they stuck a guy in to be the spokesperson. It was that to a yeah. degree, yeah, because he was the one that was the only one really pitching ideas, and I think he said, "I would kill, I would kill you to protect Kevin," and then it went to yeah. the. The Jessica Gao surrogate for the rest of that scene. She, she was cute, actually. <laughs> wasn't that the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen? Like, am that I wrong? A, it's a terrible looking writer's room. Um, <laughs> I hope it's. Not, I hope it wasn't the real writer's room, as I tweeted earlier. I hope that's just a set that they mocked up yeah. because it was. For, those walls are bare. <laughs> like, like whiteboards are crammed with like and crammed. five point font. <laughs> five point font just trying Sorry, to fit did you see you the in. series obviously it was the real writer's room <laughs> they're so, dying to be clever they're dying to be innovative they're dying to be all these things and they think what they've done is clever and innovative and it's maybe yeah. the most unclever uninnovative unimaginative thing i've ever seen i i agree with you i got the sense that they were so proud of themselves for coming you know not just uh ending the big fight scene unsatisfactorily yet again we had another show where she hulk did not hulk out no. i would have loved to see her knock down the wall to the writer's room just like as uh, a, like yeah. really upset <laughs> like what the hell and then they're like oh we we really wanted a, a skylight but i guess you know we don't have to we, have, we don't have to pay for it now um but and, yeah, and, and it, it was terrible and, all, all that stuff has been done better by other people previously that being said sure like you know copy we all copy i mean yeah, they're not deadpool out. they can't write like deadpool this is not i maybe that's what they were trying to create but this is they're not even a tinge not even a pinch of that flavor and humor and charm in the show well the the pro mo the biggest problem with the final episode was that the previous episodes were not properly structured they weren't interesting they did not have their own closure if if they were structured like a sitcom or like Ally McBeal and you had the other characters properly fleshed out and you knew their stories and the shows were entertaining uh, in of themselves. And, and you were, you know, you had the she Hulk smash every single episode. Cause that's what you're going to expect. You have to have one. And then, and then even though that's formulaic and, and repetitive and all that, but it would have been much more satisfying than if they did that fourth wall breakage fine, then I would, then I would give that to them. But you, you, you can't, it's, it's like you've made the frosting, but made no cake. That's yeah. what they've done. And it's a gluten-free frosting. Of course. <laughs> made with, with no corn. sugar. That's right. Gluten and, uh, and, uh, and lactose-free. Doesn't even have any molasses. <laughs> nope. But, you know, I, I really have to question um, a lot of things about it. And I noticed uh, in the last episode um, when her family comes to pick her up, she's almost embarrassed by them. And they've, you know, they've picked her up from jail. Do you realize that you've just been picked up from prison right. and your family has just come to get you? And she's she's almost sitting at the table. They're talking to her, trying to cheer her up and she's bummed out. And I'm thinking to myself, what is wrong with this woman? She should be grateful that they have her back, that, you know, they've always been the ones there for her. Um, she's not even grateful for that. And I, I really question that because, mm. um, you know, she would be much more humble being thrown into prison, being slandered this way in, in an incredibly predictable story. This was not, this didn't feel very original uh, at all. But um, honestly, I just felt that that was very uh, ungracious. And perhaps it reflects a lot of opinions about family and you know, they 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 went to bat for her and will continue to do so. But I have to wonder about uh, her loyalty to them. And that really bothered me, too. Well, forget about the family. What about her shitty legal cohorts? Yeah. I just give up. 
you're we don't like look we are disgusted with what you did you didn't win the award or you smashed that thing down while we were in our nice outfits yeah oh she didn't God, win her they... participation award and yeah, that's what why, it was it was a participation award why 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 didn't her legal cohorts go to bat for her this is what we're gonna do we're gonna fight this this is what we're gonna do we're gonna kick them in the bud you you don't deserve this no they just ah, bye jen it was nice seeing you and I'm you sorry, gotta I acquiesce think... to the law. Uh, doesn't matter that you were illegally recorded without your consent in a two-party consent state, <laughs> and then yeah. distributed. Uh, you know, like there's a whole legal aspect to that video recording part of of her, like her phone is technically public knowledge because it was entered into corporate trademark stuff. But the sex tape was not on her phone. That other guy videotaped it, and then it was leaked, and that's against the law and multiple laws especially in the state of California, and they don't do anything with it. They completely throw it out. The entire episode could have been about Book and the team uh, fighting on her behalf. Yeah. That w- that's enough That's enough uh, plot. Well, it's too much for these writers who don't know how to write courtroom dramas, and boy, that shows because yeah it does them not being able to write courtroom dramas that expresses themselves as them writing just a series of completely incompetent lawyers who don't know the law but even because i have even, to say the lawyers here are the worst lawyers i've ever seen in fiction anywhere well even even worse andre i just finished reading a whole whack of the she hulk uh legal uh comics and they weren't even working from legal legal precedent they went into the basement to get mar to study marvel comics from 40 years ago or whatever and in the uh in the dan slot uh, she hulks they're using marvel comic book precedents during their trials <laughs> it's hilariously clever and the judge said, you know, we go, yep, you, know, you can be a corporeal out of body, uh, blah, 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 because of episode 53, uh, uh, issue 53 of, uh, you know, of Spider-Man when he went into the metaverse and okay, case dismissed, case dismissed. So it wasn't even knowing any kind of law. The whole the whole She-Hulk over was about knowing um, Marvel law and precedent. And they didn't they didn't use that. It could they, be very they had, clever they had 28 funny. films to have drawn upon for, to use in this show, and they did none of that. And and the other part, too, is that what, what's tragic is some of the ideas that are introduced throughout these episodes had potential to be very good, yeah. but they don't think they understood the potential of it. Because I really thought, oh, you have She-Hulk breaks the fourth wall, goes to, quote unquote, the head of the studio to argue about the direction of the show – as I said on Mead last night, that should have been your mid-season turning point. Ha- hire Ed Harris to play Kevin Feige and do a Truman Show tug of war between the direction of She-Hulk. Have it a legal procedure, a procedural, and have the universe actively working against Je- uh, Jennifer uh, Walters so that she can't com- you know, represent her clients in trial because there's always some bad guy that's coming in and smashing stuff up and she has to fight it. And all she wants to do is get back to work because she loves her job. And then she finally realizes, oh, this is why these random D-list villains are coming after me is because Ed Harris up there is trying to make this an action show when it's supposed to be a female comedy, legal drama or legal comedy. (laughs) And now you have the two fighting over the direction of the show. Yeah, it's a man versus God type of thing. That would be brilliant. As I said, if someone, if we're breaking the the series down and I'm in the writer's room and someone pitches that for the finale, I'd be like, no, that's going way earlier. And we're going to mine that for everything we can for the remaining of the season and have a big, fantastic climax where it gets resolved and they come to terms like, okay, fine. We'll, we'll do both genres, but we'll, we'll balance it out better, (laughs) you know, or something of that nature, like a good negotiation within the TV writer's room between writers and producers. (laughs) There was no climax in this story, like in the series, there was nothing, you know, we weren't really given any kind of satisfaction, so to speak, uh, in the show as well. So it's it's kind of like- Well, we found out who Intelligentsia was. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah, And there was no setup for that at all. It would have been fantastic if there was a setup for that. Because we don't know why he doesn't like her. He just doesn't like her. I, I figured, wouldn't it be funny if he just got, got um, upset with her because they had a bad first date? And well, he's that's like, what I think it was. It, it, it just would. I don't think they connected it properly, though, because it just felt 
Oh, this yeah, one rich they guy should goes slip together or something like that for it to be a legitimate. Situation. Or maybe it should have been an actually legitimately fun date, but Jennifer was just being polite and was like, "Yeah, it's yes. not. I had fun with you, but I just don't see the sparks because she's superficial." And this this is the guy from that Baywatch movie, yeah, with the hairy nipples. And but they uh, needed a cool rejection so it doesn't have that connection. Exactly. Yeah, they they and put him. He was part of a montage, so he didn't have an impact. Well, they had to make fun of an Elon Musk character. <laughs> he was kind of cute. It's a shame. I mean, <laughs> oh, he was an asshole, though. I mean, again, and and what was that scene in the restaurant where he invited her there, and then she pushed the chair or the table against him to to say, you know, bug off, don't don't talk to me again. And I don't understand what that encounter was, apart from the fact that the her, her boss in that Deux Machina way said, nope, he's a rich client. You better go see him. Okay, there. That's motivation. Yeah. Uh, and the, the Nikki Probably her of agency, did, yeah. The amount of lifting Nikki did in this episode, like, oh my God. It was it's so tiresome to have this third character uh, you know moving the story along. I'm loving this a lot because you guys are trying to fix this incredibly broken on purpose show. And I'm just I'm sitting back listening to you guys come up with way better ideas, but there is no point. No, they, they're not no. interested in creating anything wonderful i love what you guys are coming up with i think scripts on to something you know paul you're on to something <sighs> i can't do it this morning our um i'm sorry hon. uh you guys are on to something but at the same time look if if a group of random youtubers you know consisting of like you know a couple of fans a former television executive an actual script doctor you know and and tom who's like you know essentially the the encyclopedia for all entertainment ever um you know it can't, it, we come up with better stuff but that you know they can't put those kinds of people in these writers rooms you know i don't think I, they're interested but do you how many how many writers are actually around anymore that actually used to be in television like 15 years ago i think they pushed them all out they got to be somewhere in hollywood maybe they're Where? just yeah. enjoying their boat no they could have been pushed out completely wrong color well, right, I mean, wrong politics. They, yeah, I'm, I'm certain that they're getting option deals, but I don't think they're getting past the options at the, because of the politics. Because I know yeah. a lot of them are still making money, but they are a little worried that they're not making the money they used to because they're not running rooms, they're not selling uh, their their scripts that they're selling on spec are, are not getting full production and and put into the uh, the actual mix of things. Uh, there there is a distance, a separation to that, and it's a tragic because you're talking about a gap of. I would say around eight years of potentially amazing scripts that have been pushed to the side because they don't match the politics that uh, the majority in Hollywood uh, support. But they're also saying that because of these, you know, poor writers who are in their now uh, script, that's making it harder for really talented people to to make money too. I mean, it's it's they've made it a situation bad for every writer out there, so it's had consequences across the board. Absolutely, but um, but this was never about making things any better. It was never about any kind of meritocracy or anything like that. It was all always about gender identity, and it's like, oh, you're white. Well, that means you can't really get the job right now. Uh, and uh, like Tom, we've heard that several people say this that now people who even are gay can't have a hard time getting uh, getting jobs because they're not high enough in the victim pyramid because they're just gay they need to be more than that in order well, to the, be the, really the considered L lgb is trying to disassociate themselves with the t that's become uh, the new political uh uh you know uh, a punching punching uh, arena it's 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 just a crazy it's a it's a crazy time um yeah. It's and then, like I said, with this last episode, it's just I, I'm going to watch it again. Uh, one of the things I wanted to comment on was why just, would you do something like that? <laughs> I'm, going to, I'm going to review it from a comedic writing perspective, uh, and and what did they think were jokes? So uh, one thing I want to confirm is, for instance, during the uh, the Bill Bixby takeoff at the beginning of uh, the episode, uh, where they parodied that. The She-Hulk, uh, the, the She-Hulk that they they made, the who stand was standing, who was unbelievably powerful. They so they were joking ahead of time that uh, they, they figured ahead of time that people would complain that the 3D 
version of She-Hulk was not going to uh, 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 pass muster, why didn't they use a real person? And now here they're already found a way ahead of any of the criticism to create a real person dressed up as She-Hulk. But I think in the in the parody it's actually a guy with fake boobs it is a man yes it, it looks is. like a man to me yeah, yeah. it, and, was, it and, looked like Lou Ferrigno honestly I mean it's not him but it looked like but um, I, I, I but one of their digs was they made the boobs extra big I am certain that that was something in the writer's room that oh yeah and we'll make it a guy and then we'll make the boobs extra big that oh good look that's gonna show the guys what kind of you know, assholes they were when they were, you know, lusting over She-Hulk. I just, I think that was in their minds. I think that's what they thought was going to be a great joke, that it's going to be a guy in drag with big boobs. And and that's how we're going to uh, make fun of the Lou Ferrigno fans. So I it thought- It wasn't it, cool. No, I thought, so, okay, you agree with me. I, I thought it was a, a nasty little dig. And it's a dig even before the show, any of the shows aired, right? I mean, they, they, they could have picked any woman who is fit to have sure. played the role of Correct. that, you know, and it would have been amazing looking. Um, we probably would have been so surprised by how cool she looked. Yeah. I think that's what they, think that's what they should have done through the whole show, personally. Yep. But, um, you know, they went with CGI and that's what they decided to do. But I think the CGI was a mistake. But, that's how yeah, and they didn't even pick that seven foot whatever woman who's her stand in during the. Uh, during the takes, they didn't dress her up. They got a guy with enlarged fake breasts, which is that's the kick in the head. That that to well, me. Well, maybe that guy <laughs> identifies as a woman. Maybe, and and uh, that I would find accepting. I would accept that. Yeah, I'm sure that uh, the, the people in the writers room and the producers obviously did. I thought I he did really well. You mean when he was? I he was very ferocious. It was, it was great. Good to see that. But I still think that this character should have been like sexy as whatever. Like she should have been the sexiest woman you've seen in ages. And I also think that would have been groundbreaking for this character because she is sexy. She's a sexy looking character. You mean as so, she? Huh? Yes, absolutely. Well, yeah. been, she has been drawn many different ways. Yes. She, she's. But been I think for the show. Muscular. Yeah, they should have made it her transform into an even sexier character. This is I how they I think tried they that. Be. I think that's what they were trying to do, but it didn't didn't work. Hey, you think you're giving them too much credit, but I do I think, think so too. And uh, yeah, I mean, they intentionally went out of their way to produce the '70s version of She-Hulk. Yes, that's what they did, but and they, they did, did it as a middle finger exactly, and they did it in the and as as close to a you know. A, a, a an insult as they possibly could the middle finger you're referring to and it look it irritated everybody and everybody saw through it this is the problem the, the they think they're clever they're not mm. they're not the, the, that's just another example of very bad writing and it's a shame you know there again there was a lot of room for opportunities here they took none of them and and they and, have this idea that all men are a certain way, like that club that they had that the, uh, you know, the uh, um, talk, yeah, talk was leading. Yeah, they're poking fun at the manosphere is what that yes. is. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. and uh, then they had the lawyer pug try to pretend to do manly things. Yeah, the male feminist. He, he was to, oh. have to say that this part that dude pug, the supreme male feminist, he was like their their dream gay friend, yes. I guess. Yeah, he was like, a, like just uh, any man listening out there, or any and all man listening. You just have to look at that guy. That is the guy that they say is a good guy who's instantly friend zoned, and who is afraid of women, and who collects shoes because that was his hobby: collecting shoes, ladies' shoes, and, well, uh, and ladies' who, underwear. <laughs> yeah, and who can't get along with other men and Jesus is Kevin. It's 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 Paul Feig. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, well, they also think that we. Just, I just come to the, I just described Paul Feig. That's their dream man. Their I mean, dream Kevin bestie. Feig. It's no, oh, no, no, Paul, Kevin, no, not Kevin. No, Feig. Paul Feig, Feig the, the director, the Ghostbuster director, because he's just like that. He's another man who only goes along with women, and he hates other men, and he can't relate to other men. But they, they bullied him and called him a slur, which sounds like his name, Feig. When he was a kid, and that made made him a male misandrist. That's true. Just I, like Pug here. 
Well, and I look at it and I'm like, uh, they actually believe, and this is, again, comes down to the poor understanding of anything that they're criticizing, um, that the the people that you know are critical of this show utilize the word female as a pejorative which it you know we the, the, because they made a big point of like yeah just say female you know whenever you're talking about females right you know that was like the strength of their joke they, they they think that that's like an argument to be made when you know they're the ones that from the very beginning were talking about you know female characters and, and you know we need a strong female lead we need these other things and they, for whatever reason, they think that that we use female as a derogatory term. It was very frustrating. I, I mean, didn't think you... any of the any of the actors who are pretending to be uh, uh, cucks or whatever, like not, I mean the the incels, the, the incels. incels yeah. um, wanted to be there. Like right. it was a paycheck. It's it's like uh, you know any black guy in a in a Viagra ad. He doesn't want to really be in there. <laughs> wow. <laughs> There should always be. A, I've always figured there should be a disclaimer. I'm just an actor. I really can get an erection. You know, I'm just here for you know because I gotta represent. But this is no not me. me. I'm, I'm acting. It's I would totally use would it to my advantage. I'd be like, "Oh my god, honey, you fixed me!" And then she thinks she's like all that in a bag of chips. There you go. There you go. Wow, that's pretty devious, Tom. That is Tom is devious. That's the that was only funny way as shit. And the fool, or fool his wife. He puts an end to on. Well, that killed things. Yeah, sorry. No, anyway, it's just the I show. It. It's it's difficult to kind of function after seeing. Oh, well, that's like the thing. We, we basically we need vodka and lots of it to be able to to, to function <laughs> yeah. properly after this. Because I have to say, I honestly think this was the worst most insulting series finale or season finale, whatever the case may be, I have ever seen. Yeah. I have never seen anything that goes to these lengths to insult its own audience. Not the not the target audience that the writers wrote for, but the audience of the brand that they are associated with. And to move the conversation along, I th there is something that I want to hear all your opinions about, and that was the meta part of this, where basically she tries to do this uh, empowering thing by saying that no, you will not decide my story. I decide my story. I will tell my own truth, and you, Hulk, get out of my story because I rule here. I'm being the narcissist I am. And then she even went to the Arsatz Kevin Feige and, uh, and said, no, 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 you're doing two formulaic stuff. This is how we're going to no, do no, it. No, no, not Kevin Feige. He went, she went to the manager. I said Arsatz. No, no, no. Feige. She went to the manager. Yeah, that's true. Uh, let manager. me see your manager. <laughs> let me see yeah. your manager. Uh, the the robot, which, uh, which might as well be. But how did you appreciate that whole meta thing, trying to take a dig at... Marvel being too formulaic, but then they offer this instead. So I know I can tell uh, as a comedian that uh, first of all, the you know uh, the people in the Marvel universe are not without a sense of humor, and and I, I would say that when the writers' room came up with that and they pitched it to Kevin and said, "Hey, we're going to make fun of you," I'm sure he thought it was the funniest thing in the world. I don't think he took it personally. That's probably Kevin Feige that, calling you right now. I was going to say, is that She-Hulk on the line, Paul? <laughs> yeah. Hello? Oh, Kevin. Yeah. <laughs> nice talking with you. What's up? Oh, I'm with the guys here. Oh, you're watching us. You're you're not liking what you're seeing. Well, you know, I'm sorry. When are you leaving the MCU? Just want to know. Stop telling people how bad the show is. <laughs> yeah. Wow. <laughs> I could have done that whole thing right now. I don't know. I'm going to stop. Yeah. Well, so so yeah. Any thoughts on uh, on on that? Was it brilliant? Was that a much needed meta commentary, or did it fall completely flat on its face and burn down the MCU in the process? Well, who is this going to appeal to? That meta stuff. Culture. Did the meta stuff appeal to you? No, no. Look, from from beginning to end, I I thought that it was very poorly done. So, I, but I mean, you guys know that. 
I've I've been out on this show since the first episode. So, and uh, I'm glad that Chris jo- Chris Gore also joined us on this ledge. So. <laughs> Well, we liked the first two. I mean, Chris Gore and I both liked the first I know. two episodes. We thought, well, oh, this this has got some possibilities. I mean, I as a network head, I've got very at former network head, I've got a lot of sympathy for people trying to put something together, and no one ever figures this stuff really at the very beginning. They kind of figure it out as they as they go. But uh, no, the raison d'etre of this show was uh, on full display on that last episode. Yeah. Yeah. And yeah, I just I like I said, I just this was never gonna work for me as far as meta. I'm sure other people have a different answer, but yeah, no, yeah, me, you know, the, the... maybe you know, I, I guess uh having something formulaic uh is a dirty word, and they wanted to not be part of that formula. But without checks and balances and, and without restrictions, you actually don't get creative. It's the restrictions that make you creative. It's when you solve those restrictions and work around them, not completely, uh, what's the word, uh, uh, subvert them. Uh, that's not where you get creative. Subverting the rules isn't creative. It's using using the rules to the best of your advantage. So I my, my biggest issue with this show is that Um, I I believe the audience is a more simpler organism that people make them out to be, which is why sitcom, good sitcoms work, well, even bad sitcoms work, because they're formulaic. And and again, if you're trying to make something uh, uh, successful, then you've got to play to that formula, whether you like it or not, because it works every single time. Uh, People hate it, and uh, people have argued with me over it, but again, you're talking to the great unwashed out there. You're trying to make money. You're not trying to win awards. Do you think that She-Hulk is going to win awards for its representation and empowerment? Will it become a cult classic? Uh, like, Will uh, we be talking about uh, it in Rose? 60 years? Oh, wrong franchise. But yeah. <laughs> Point stands. I, and you know, it, it's funny. I still view it as something unique but but failed like i i have an overall impression of she hulk that i don't have of obi-wan obi-wan was just this weird mess but she hulk still has a thing i can't i can't describe it yeah no one else can either and (laughs) unfortunately it's not a good thing no, I mean, no, it's, it's something, it's something that you can't describe, and it's not because it's good, but because of the absolute sheer awfulness of it all. 